And good morning, everyone. Today is Knockout Opioid Abuse Day in New Jersey. It's our statewide day of education and awareness on the opioid and addiction crisis. And I thank you for joining us um, for this learning series webinar today. Knockout Opioid Abuse Day, where we stand and how we move forward. And we're so happy to bring this conversation to you today. Um, as well as all of the other activities that I know so many of you are doing throughout the day. So, so thank you for taking the time to join us. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Partnership for a Drug for New Jersey and is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. And I thank them for their partnership support and collaboration for today's learning activity and throughout the whole year for the Knockout Opioid Abuse Day learning series that we do to continue the messages of, of today um, throughout the year. So I hope uh, if this is your first time joining us, that you'll continue to tune in each month for uh, a learning activity related to this topic. We're so pleased to have our uh, featured keynote speaker with us today, Dr. Andrew Kolodny, who's a nationally recognized expert on this topic. Dr. Kolodny joins us from Brandeis University. So thank you, Dr. Kolodny, for being here. Um, to provide some opening comments from the New Jersey Governor's Office, we have Jennifer Fearon, the Health and Human Services Policy Advisor, and John Butler, the Criminal Justice Policy Advisor. And I'm gonna turn the presentation over to them to, uh, to get us started, but I wanna thank Governor Murphy for designating this important day of awareness and education um, so that we can all pause today in our state and look at the opioid and addiction crisis and, and find ways that we can all uh, play a role in eradicating it. So uh, John and Jennifer, I will turn the presentation over to you. Sure, thanks so much, Angela. And, and, and good morning, everybody. And, and thank you to New Jersey Cares and Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey for hosting us uh, at uh, uh, Knockout Opioid Abuse Day. We're really uh, thrilled to be here. Um, and, and thank you to everybody uh, who's on the line for joining in this really important conversation. Um, you know, today we, we remember those who are lost to uh, overdoses and those who have been negatively impacted by um, substance use and, uh, uh, and, and, um, and overdoses. Um, but we're also here to, to, to talk a little bit about how uh, we might avert this crisis, uh, curb this crisis, and how uh, certainly at least our administration is, is uh, working to try to combat some of the uh, negative externalities of drug use here in New Jersey. Um, my name is John Butler. I'm the criminal justice policy advisor in the governor's office. Um, I've been working in criminal justice policy for a bit over a decade uh, with a, and a special focus on drug policy and harm reduction. Um, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jen, to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Jennifer Fearon. I'm the policy advisor for Health and Human Services, and I've been working in public health for over a decade now. Um, just to ground our remarks today, we really wanted to touch upon the fact that last year over uh, 3,000 people died of suspected drug-related deaths in New Jersey. Um, on an equity front, while rates of fatal overdoses have declined for white, non-Hispanic New Jersey residents, um, they've steadily climbed for Black and Hispanic New Jerseyans in recent years. Uh, to John's point, uh, to put that, this sort of data to action in New Jersey, we're working in this administration across sort of the continuum of care, uh, preventing overdose and drug-related deaths, expanding access to services and supports that help stabilize individuals with problematic drug use, breaking silent cycles of trauma and promoting resiliency, and of course, replacing punitive responses to drug use with public health strategies and interventions. Uh, through these efforts, uh, the, so far this year, while there have been over 2,000 uh, suspected drug deaths in New Jersey. Uh, there have been over 9,000 administrations of uh, naloxone, which is a life-saving drug used to reduce overdoses. Uh, from 2020 to 2021, we saw a 2.7% decrease in opioid prescriptions dispensed in New Jersey. And also at our harm reduction centers around the state, we have seven of them at this point. They've served over 3,000 clients last year and made more than 1,000 referrals uh, for care, including substance use disorder treatment. Um, we're going to speak a little bit uh, before our featured speaker today, uh, who will speak about the progression of the opioid crisis, about some of the multi-sector work underway across New Jersey to afford opioid-related deaths and promote harm reduction. So with that, I'll turn it back to John. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the principles that we apply when we're looking at drug policy across the state. Um, first and foremost, we apply uh, harm reduction and compassion, and we try to, to, to 
you know, interject at every stage in the continuum of care uh, for people who use drugs uh, and who suffer from substance use disorder. Um, in, in, in order uh, to, to sort of put these principles into, into practice, our state agencies have focused their efforts on a few key initiatives um, while trying to, like I said, interject at every stage on the process. A core component of, of our effort is, to, is the establishment and expansion of harm reduction centers, uh, also uh, commonly referred to as syringe access programs in other states. Uh, these are community-based programs that provide a self, safe and welcoming space uh, for people who use drugs to access sterile syringes, needles, injection equipment, and other um, uh, 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 tools like naloxone, um, along with uh, uh, providing an entry point to critical health and prevention services. Um, HRCs also provide uh, education on safer use, overdose prevention, safe disposal of used equipment, um, and clients can bring their, their used syringes to HRCs um, to leave uh, 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 and dispose of them properly. Um, uh, HRCs provide a comprehensive approach uh, to harm reduction by integrating behavioral interventions and access to services to prevent and reduce transmission of HIV and other bloodborne diseases. Um, in addition to syringe expansion uh, and, and public health through community-based programming, um, we're incredibly focused on providing individuals who use drugs with access to medication-assisted treatment. Um, it's vital to uh, the recovery process for many people. And while we let our colleagues in DHS and DOH handle the, the specifics of that, um, uh, we're uh, focused on increasing uh, access in a few specific ways, including low threshold medication-assisted um, treatment at um, uh, harm reduction centers, uh, expanded hours for opioid treatment programs, uh, and provision of buprenorphine to paramedics um, so that paramedics can issue bu uh, bup uh, at the point of overdose um, uh, when they're responding. Um, finally, to us, harm reduction also means providing first responders pharmacies, uh, homeless shelters, reentry organizations, and others who are closest to people who use drugs um, with the tools they need to serve individuals who use drugs. So in addition to trainings uh, and, um, and other technical assistance, we are also provide uh, free naloxone uh, uh, for, um, uh, for distribution at those, uh, at those sort of frontline points. And of course, going hand in hand with the programmatic work, there's an extensive amount of policy work that's gone on through the, with our legislative partners. Uh, Governor Murphy has recently expanded the scope and capacity of harm reduction efforts uh, through a series of bills that really aim at ensuring the safety and dignity of individuals using drugs in New Jersey. Um, this includes the creation of new overdose fatality review committees. Uh, these will provide additional insight uh, into the causes of overdose and better allow local and state government to develop responsive interventions. Additionally, um, S3009 will allow for harm reduction centers to expand into additional locations across the state. Uh, and, and it gives the Department of Health greater ability to support harm reduction centers that where need is greatest. Additionally, um, S3093 aligns state policy with harm reduction values by ensuring that drug users are not punished for the possession of syringes and are able to freely utilize clean syringes as they work towards recovery. There's still a great amount of work that needs to be done in this space, um, but these three bills lay out the groundwork for the expansion of harm reduction efforts. Um, as we move towards the expansion, um, building connections uh, to the community organizations and providers, uh, local leaders, and people who are use drugs will be uh, crucial to making sure that new programs are not just established, but uh, supported as they provide services. In a lot of ways, I think the, the elephant in the room for drug policy, not just in New Jersey, but I think across the country is the, um, the large Janssen settlement uh, with opioid manufacturers to um, uh, provide uh, hundreds of, of millions of dollars to states across the country, including 640, a little over $640 million here. Um, and we're gonna talk about that, but I also, before we do, <laughs> wanna touch on some of the other um, funding that we've already gotten and dispersed here in New Jersey. This includes a, a smaller settlement with INSYS CEO, John Kapoor and McKinsey for $14 million, which uh, the state received and has already begun dispersing, um, uh, including to uh, uh, programs that, that um, 
serve uh, children with uh, trauma, uh, a, a, a diversion program called Op for Help, um, peer recovery supports, motivational interview, interview training, um, as well as uh, expansion for harm reduction services, which we, we talked uh, about a little bit. Um, we're also receiving other federal money um, that's going to be uh, a, a roughly $66 million in federal money uh, that's going to be used to, to expand access to buprenorphine, access to naloxone, uh, and other things um, through our Department of Human Services. And so, again, before we talk about the $641 million that is coming to the state, uh, we want to highlight some of the other money that we've received um, uh, and are spending on this, these efforts. Uh, yeah, now, now to that, that, that very elephant, which is um, currently we're uh, working through the fact that New Jersey will receive a total of $641 million in settlement funds. Um, that will be divided across uh, state and local governments in New Jersey over the next two decades. Uh, we also know that earlier this summer, additional settlements were reached uh, that will provide further funding to the state for this work. Um, in alignment with the sort of terms of those settlement agreements, the funding will go towards goals, including treating opioid disorder, use disorder, addressing the needs of criminal justice involved individuals, offering harm reduction services, preventing overdose deaths and supporting research and training and many other topics. Um, back in August on the 31st, uh, we issued executive order uh, number 305. Uh, and through this, the governor established the, an opioid recovery and remediation advisory council. Uh, this will be chaired in the, the Department of Human Services and includes the Attorney General, Commissioners of Health and Human Sur uh, Health and Children and Families, as well as uh, rel relevant stakeholders. Uh, this advisory council will be providing recommendations to Governor Murphy um, on uh, prioritization and effective use of these funds. Um, and of course, the council's membership will reflect New Jersey's diversity, including people who have lived experience with the opioid epidemic. And now uh, a, a sort of call to action. In addition to the advisory <laughs> council, we've set up an online portal, uh, which we launched in conjunction with the uh, Department of Human Services and the Office of Information Technology to provide anybody in the public with an opportunity to weigh in on how these funds should be spent. Um, it can range from general suggestions uh, or principles that should be applied when thinking about how to spend this money to specific uh, project proposals. And, and there's even an, an, an option to attach uh, make an attack, you know, an attachment if you if you have an actual like written proposal as well. Um, but really, we encourage anybody with um, somebody something to say or opinion on these issues or expertise on these issues or knowledge of these issues or passion on these issues, which I imagine is 100% of the people on this uh, on this Zoom uh, to submit uh, comments to the portal so that it can help inform this work. Um, the comments will be reviewed by relevant state agencies. Um, and will be considered as part of, uh, you know, the proposal process um, as we develop spending plans uh, and as the advisory council council begins, um, you know, advising on spending plans. Uh, the, just logistically, the portal, the, the website for the portal is on the screen, and I'm sure we'll be able to, somebody, if not us, will be able to post it in the chat um, for easier access. Um, uh, and it will be open for 60 days, uh, which is through October 31st, so through the end of the month. Um, uh, and uh, will hopefully be recurring year on year as this money um, is getting allocated and spent year on year. Um, so yeah, so we certainly encourage you to, to, to submit um, uh, comments to that. Um, and just to close, I you know thank you again for for the time and and for giving us the opportunity to speak to this group. Uh, I, th I think this is an administration that's really um, zeroed in and focused on uh, combating uh, the opioid epidemic and open and, and reducing and or eliminating overdose deaths, especially. Um, and we're uh, incredibly eager to hear from you and um, the public and, and experts on how to. Um, allocate the tremendous amount of funding that we are receiving in a way that that most directly impacts people who are using drugs or who are in recovery. Um, so thanks again, Angela and, and the partnership and NJ Cares for inviting us and uh, we look forward to the rest of the presentations. Great, thank you. Thank you to both of you um, for being with us today. Um, and please extend the thanks and appreciation of all of us who are on this webinar today, both from the partnership, uh, as well as all of our attendees to Governor Murphy for his um, focus and the focus of all of you uh, on this important issue. You are saving lives and uh, your, your work is being noticed. So thank you so much.
uh, for making New Jersey a leader on this topic. Without uh, anything further, I will turn now the presentation over to Dr. Andrew Kolodny. Dr. Kolodny, welcome. Thank you, Angela, and it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to give everybody an update on the opioid uh, crisis. I will um, try and um, help people better understand some of the, the current trends um, and um, also uh, go over some of the interventions that are necessary right now for bringing the crisis under control. So let me just start by saying something that um, should be obvious, but, but it isn't. Um, when, it's not even obvious to many doctors who prescribe opioids. Uh, when we talk about prescription opioids, uh, drugs, for example, that contain hydrocodone or oxycodone or hydromorphone, uh, these are drugs that are literally made from opium. Opium is the sap of the poppy plant and existing naturally inside that sap of, of the poppy plant, opium, existing naturally are the opiates, codeine, morphine, and thebane. And it's from the opiates, the naturally occurring opioids, that we can make semi-synthetic opioids. Heroin, oxycodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxymorphone, um, these are semi-synthetic because you make them from opium, you make them from something natural. So they're half synthetic, semi-synthetic, you could think of. Um, and when we use the term opioids, that term encompasses the naturally occurring opiates like codeine and morphine that exist inside opium. It includes the semi-synthetics, which are made from opium. And it includes the completely synthetics like fentanyl, methadone, and tramadol. Another one not on this slide is tapentadol, which is in a drug called Nucinta. All of these are opioids, meaning that they all of these drugs interact with the brain's opiate receptors. And something that many people don't recognize is that for many of these opioids, their effects are almost indistinguishable. So some people use the term gateway uh, to talk about people who might transition from prescription opioids to heroin. You know, the, the term gateway really isn't appropriate because when we talk about oxycodone and hydrocodone, we're talking about drugs that are essentially the same as heroin. The effects that oxycodone and heroin produce are, uh, that are, are indistinguishable. An experienced heroin user can't really tell the difference between oxycodone or, or heroin. They're essentially the same drug. Fentanyl, on the other hand, is quite a bit more potent and produces effects that, that um, are a bit faster and, and shorter lasting than heroin or oxycodone or hydrocodone. Now, this is an old slide. Uh, the CDC came out with this slide in 2010 and back in 2010, there was about a three year lag in the, in the data that they were sharing publicly. And when CDC came out with this slide in 2010, they had just started using the term epidemic to refer to the opioid crisis. And when they began using the term epidemic, they started to get criticized. The criticism was coming from organizations that were funded by drug companies that make opioids. And these were organizations that were advocating for more opioid prescribing. And they got mad at the CDC for calling the opioid crisis an epidemic. And they said, you know, you're exaggerating and it, it's not an epidemic. If you keep using that term, you'll scare doctors from prescribing opioids. So knock it off. The CDC responded to its critics by putting together this slide. And what you see here with this box that says heroin, that box is showing you the rate of drug overdose deaths in the United States during the height of the heroin epidemic. And if you look to the right, you see the box that says cocaine, that's the crack cocaine epidemic. And you're looking at the rate of drug overdose deaths during the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. 
And so when the CDC put together this slide, they, they were really responding to their critics by saying, this is an epidemic. Where the CDC, we don't use the term epidemic lightly. And not only is this an epidemic, it's the worst overdose epidemic in US history. And that was the point they were making. Now, the last bar on this graph is 2007. And you, the, the CDC was showing the sharp increase that we had experienced. I want you to recognize that in 2008, that last purple blue bar went higher. In 2009, it went up again. In 2010, it went up again. So even though the CDC was referring to this as the worst overdose epidemic in history, every year since 2007, deaths have gone up. Every year we've basically set a new record for overdose deaths and then the next year we break that record and, and in the last five years that rate of increase has skyrocketed faster than anything we've ever seen before and i'll show you what i'm referring to in a moment, this is still an old slide. And this is you know because the previous slide wasn't breaking down the deaths by drug type. This slide does, and it shows you what the picture looked like up to 2010. And what you can see is that what was really driving the increase until around 2010, 2011 was the red line. And even though heroin is, is certainly an opioid, as I started by saying, um, the red line is referring to prescription opioids. Heroin is in green at the bottom. And you could see up until 2010, it was really prescription opioids driving the crisis. You can see that that picture has changed quite a bit since 2010. And so this is a much more current graph. And on this graph, I'd like you to start by looking at the orange line um, that was the top line up until around 2015 when the blue line crossed it. So the orange line on this graph is prescription opioids. And you could see up until around 2015 prescription opioids were still the number one drug involved in an overdose death in the United States. After 2015, that picture changed. And what you're looking at with that blue line that's practically a straight line up, those are deaths that have been that have involved illicit fentanyl. Now, I also want you to look at the yellow line. The yellow line is heroin. And so if you sort of take in these trends, what you'll see is that from around 1999 um, until around 2011, opioid overdose deaths were almost entirely prescription opioid. And then you see that yellow line going up that starts to go up around 2012. Um, and then around 2015 is where you see the fentanyl go up. Now, there's a very common narrative to explain these trends in prescription opioids, heroin, and fentanyl, that's not really accurate. You'll often hear the term three waves used to describe what the, the trend. And, and typically the way that narrative is explained is that we had a prescription opioid problem, and then there was a crackdown on the prescription opioids. So drug users switched to heroin, which is the yellow line going up, and then around 2015, they switched to fentanyl, which is the sharp blue line going up. And there are elements of that narrative which are correct. For example, switching is correct, and I'll show you that in a minute. But it's not really correct at all to describe the crisis by looking at the deaths that the drugs that are involved in the deaths. That narrative suggests that we have this homogenous population of drug users in the United States that have been switching from from one opioid to another as uh, based on availability. And that's really not at all true. We don't have a, a homogenous group of drug users in, in the United States. There's a very important epidemiology, which I'll explain which is really critical to understanding what's happening right now with opioids. And we also, so we don't have this homogenous groups, but also there are very important 
geographic differences that we have to take into account. Before I go into the epidemiology, I just want to cover one other important recent trend, and that's a trend in overdose deaths involving adolescents, essentially teenagers. And something that we've seen in the past year and a half has been a very sharp increase in deaths in teenagers, um, essentially a 100% increase in, in teenagers. And these are teenagers who are losing their lives also to, to fentanyl. Now, even though we've seen this very sharp increase in teenagers who are likely to be experimenting with drugs containing fentanyl, rather than addicted um, because they are because they're young, um, even though we've seen a very sharp increase, overall their deaths really do account for about 1% of the overall opioid mortality. So if roughly speaking, we had about 100,000 drug overdose deaths in the past 12 months, about 1,000 of them have involved teenagers, about 99,000 have involved adults ranging from young adults to, to seniors and those 99,000 deaths are more likely to be occurring in individuals suffering from opioid addiction, rather than individuals who are experimenting with with drugs. This is the the most current data that's available from the CDC it was released last month and there is you know, potentially hopeful news on this slide. What we're looking at are opioid overdose deaths in the United States. The black line represents total opioid deaths. The brown line represents deaths involving fentanyl. The orange line there is prescription opioids. The blue line is, is heroin. And when I say potentially helpful, what I'm referring to here is that for the past few months, at least for the period that the most current data that's available, opioid overdose deaths, even fentanyl deaths, didn't go up. They actually came down a little bit. We don't know if this trend is going to continue. If this trend does continue, where each month we're seeing a decline, then that will mean ultimately that we finally turn the corner on, on overdose deaths. Um, so it's, it's too soon to say whether or not this trend is going to continue. But it is notable because what we had been seeing is almost every month we were setting a new record. Now we're seeing finally uh, months that have fewer overdose deaths than the preceding month. Now I want to go back to something I said earlier. I mentioned that that three waves narrative is not really accurate. One of the reasons that that three waves nar narrative isn't accurate is one looks at those trends and looks at the point at which heroin deaths started to go up. And if you remember, that was around 2012. Um, that's heroin deaths. And the reason we may have seen an increase in deaths might not have been a sudden increase in switching, but maybe an increase in the dangerousness of, of the heroin supply, an increase in purity, um, a decrease in price can lead to more deaths. The switching from prescription opioids to heroin among young white people in the United States happened much earlier. It happened really at the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. Now to explain this graph, I want you to begin by looking at the graph on the right. The graph on the right is blacks ages, um, and I want you to look really at the red line, which is the 20 to 34 year age group. If you look at young black people in the United States, you'll see essentially a decrease in in heroin measured uh, heroin use measured by people receiving treatment for heroin addiction and a decreasing heroin addiction among young black people in the United States has been a trend in place for more than 40 years. And if you look at the age groups among blacks where people were most likely to be getting treatment for heroin, it was that green line. It was older Blacks, particularly Black men, although that uh, this graph is just showing you age groupings. Now, if, I, if you look at the graph on the left, that would be um, showing you whites. And if you look at the red line, it's whites 20 to 34 years of age. And you see this soaring increase in heroin treatment admissions. 
um, suggesting that addiction involving heroin in young white people in the United States really starts to go up at the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. And the prescription opioid crisis actually begins around 1996. Up until the emergence of fentanyl, let me just make one other point here on this graph. Um, do you see the green line on the left? That would be white people 45 and up. You don't see a rise in, in heroin. Now that doesn't mean that older white people in the United States have been spared from the opioid crisis. In fact, it's a group that's been hit especially hard. But what we really haven't seen is the switching to heroin like we saw with younger white people. And that's because older white people haven't really needed to switch to heroin. An older white person that becomes addicted to their prescription opioids is generally more easily able to get lots of pills on a monthly basis from doctors for for a chronic pain problem. It was the younger people that really the young adults that had more difficulty getting doctors to prescribe them an aggressive supply on a monthly basis for for chronic pain. So it was that group that wound up on the black market. It was that group that was switching to heroin. Now, before fentanyl emerged, we were actually seeing more opioid overdose deaths in older white people, um, older uh, middle-aged and older Americans who were getting addicted to prescription opioids. You see that on this graph. So th these are opioid overdose deaths. The light blue is opioid pain reliever deaths. The dark blue is heroin. And do you see where it says um, the, the column for 45 to 54? If you look at that group of middle-aged Americans, you see that that's the group with the highest rate of deaths and it was involving prescription opioids. If you were to only look at heroin, you would see that the age group with the highest rate of heroin death was the 24 to 34 year group. Once fentanyl emerged, that trend began to change. And you can see it here on this graph. At the, on the X axis, you have age groupings. And here you see with the emergence of fentanyl, an increase in deaths in this younger group of people who had switched from prescription opioids to heroin. Now, when you look at the impact of fentanyl, Fentanyl today, and it's one of the reasons why we've seen during COVID just this soaring, skyrocketing increase in fentanyl-related overdose deaths, but originally fentanyl was affecting almost entirely the eastern half of the United States. It wasn't really until latter years and then sped up during COVID that we started to see the fentanyl problems spread to the western half of the United States, but initially it was the eastern half. and the geographic areas that were most impacted and that continue to be most impacted by fentanyl were actually inner city communities where you had large numbers of pop of people who had survived the heroin epidemic of the 1970s mainly older black and latino men and so the geographic area which experienced to, uh, up until 2016 the, the greatest increase in fentanyl related overdose deaths was actually inner city Washington DC. Washington DC was an urban area hit very hard with heroin in the 1970s and you had many older black men in their 50s and up who had survived that epidemic, um, but were now dying at an extremely high rate from fentanyl. And although the District of Columbia had the highest rate we saw similar trends in Baltimore, North Philly, South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, East Harlem, and some of the inner city areas of New Jersey as well. So I'm gonna summarize what I've said so far, um, which is, and really what I've been explaining so far is the epidemiology of our opioid crisis, really the epidemiology of opioid addiction in the United States. And what you see is we roughly speaking have three groups of opioid addicted Americans. We have a young, or I should say young-ish group because they've aged over time. That's a cohort that's, that's, that's really reaching middle age now of young 
people who are were have been disproportionately white. Their addiction began with prescription opioids and they switched to heroin. And the reason that they switched to heroin was because it produces the same effect as oxycodone, which or hydrocodone, which may have been the opioid they were first addicted to. Um, but it was much cheaper on the black market. And so this is a group that switched to prescription opioids after getting addicted, switched to heroin after getting addicted to prescription opioids. The second group is a group that has been in their 40s and up. These are individuals who also developed their addiction from prescription opioids, generally from medical use of prescription opioids rather than non-medical use. And this is a group that really hasn't been switching in large numbers to heroin. Um, it's a group that um, was has really been most impacted by prescription opioids. And it's a group that seems to be doing a bit better right now, now that prescribing has been trending in a more cautious direction, which we'll go over in a moment. The last group is a group that really up until very recently has been getting very little attention. And again, these are survivor, largely survivors of the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. Some of these are individuals who became addicted um, during the 1980s, some, some during the crack cocaine epidemic, which increased heroin use a little bit among people who were addicted to crack cocaine. And these are individuals who are disproportionately non-white, they're disproportionately men uh, and, and from urban areas. Let's talk a little bit about defining the opioid crisis. These are headlines that have appeared in newspapers over the, the uh, past few years. Headlines in articles about the opioid crisis. Headlines about the, the, the enormous number of Americans dying of opioid-related overdoses. Uh, far more Americans dying of an opioid overdose in one year than we lost in the entire 20 years of the Vietnam conflict. Soaring increases in inf infants born opioid dependent, children winding up in the foster care system, outbreaks of injection related infectious diseases, impact on the workforce. And you know, these, these are articles, uh, these are headlines and articles about the opioid crisis, but how should we define the opioid crisis or how, how shouldn't we define the opioid crisis? Let me start with how we should not define the opioid crisis. We should not define the opioid crisis as an epidemic of drug abuse. If you define this as an abuse crisis, which is really the way that Purdue and the Sackler family worked very hard to define the problem. We, we know from, from documents that have become public that that Richard Sackler wrote in an email in the early 2000s when OxyContin was getting bad press, that you know we have to hammer on the abusers. They're the junkies and the criminals. And, you know, and essentially we have to blame the problem on the abusers um, because it was leading to bad press for their, their product. This is not an abuse crisis. If you call it an abuse crisis, what you're really, I think, suggesting is that the problem is we have a lot of people behaving badly taking dangerous drugs because it feels good and they're accidentally killing themselves. And, you know, if if you frame it that way, the challenge is how do we stop this bad behavior? But this is not an abuse crisis. This is not a crisis of people saying, hey, uh, injecting fentanyl would be a fun way to spend a Friday night. That's not accurate. Overwhelmingly, the deaths are occurring in people who became addicted. Now, it is true that some people became addicted because they were abusing opioids, meaning they were taking them because they liked the effect, and that's how they got addicted. Other people became addicted taking opioids as prescribed by doctors, maybe even taking them exactly as prescribed, and that's how they got addicted. Regardless of how someone became addicted, once you're addicted, what drives the continued use more than anything else is not that taking an opioid is fun. Once you're addicted, what drives the continued use is that without the drug, it's almost impossible to feel any degree of pleasure. And if you go without the drug long enough, you feel very, very sick. 
And when I say sick, I'm not just talking about the flu-like symptoms that many of us understand or associated with opioid withdrawal. When someone's going into withdrawal, it's not just the physical symptoms. There's also very severe anxiety. It's like a panic attack. It's been described as a sense of impending doom. People really feel like they're going to die when they start to, when they run out of opioids, if they haven't taken them, which is why you'll see people do very desperate things to maintain their, their supply of opioids. So this is not an abuse crisis. It's an addiction epidemic. That's the correct way to really frame the problem. And when you frame it that way, what you're saying is that all of these health and social problems listed on this slide have been caused by an increase in the number of Americans suffering from opioid addiction. And if you frame it the, the right way, if you frame this as an epidemic of opioid addiction, the strategies for controlling it become a lot more clear, which we'll go over in a, in a moment. But there generally it means you have to prevent people from getting addicted and you have to see that people who are addicted get effective treatment. Here's the epidemic happening over time. Um, this is, and I, I said earlier, the epidemic began in 1996. This is three years into the epidemic. And you can see just a few states were lighting up as red or maroon. Those were the states with the highest rate of people seeking treatment for addiction to prescription opioids. I want you to watch what happens to the color of the map as we go forward in time. So 99. 2001, you see many more states turning red or maroon. 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. So by 2009, we were in the midst of a severe epidemic. Every state in the country had experienced a sharp increase in the number of Americans seeking treatment for addiction to to prescription opioids. And when you have a sharp increase in a disease over a short period of time, that is an epidemic. Now, what caused this epidemic? One of the first answers to that question and one of the best answers came from the CDC. And this was data that the CDC put together many years ago um, to try and explain what was happening. And this was a slide put together by uh, Dr. Len Palazzi, who passed away uh, recently. Uh, Dr. Palazzi was the medical director of the CDC's Injury Prevention Center. He was the guy at the CDC responsible for accidental deaths, injury deaths. And he starts to recognize early in the 2000s that the number of Americans dying from poisoning was taking off. And he looks at the trend and he, and he recognizes that you know, if this trend in poison deaths increase, continues to increase, we'll have, we'll have more Americans dying from poisoning than from a motor vehicle accident, from, from car crashes. And, and obviously for, for decades, car crashes were the number one cause of accidental death. So he says, if this trend con continues, it will surpass car crash deaths. As you all know, that trend did continue and has far surpassed car crash deaths. So, um, but to make sense of this, well, Dr. Palazzi figured out very quickly that these poison deaths were deaths involving prescription opioids. He could figure that out because the CDC had the death certificate data. The next thing he really needed to figure out was why are there so many prescription opioid deaths, why are they going up so rapidly? And to answer that question, he did something pretty neat on this slide. What he did was he charted out in orange the, the prescription opioid overdose deaths. And then in yellow, on the same graph, he charted out sales for prescription opioids. And what he was showing us was that as the sales, as the prescribing went up, rapidly, the deaths involving prescription opioids went right up along with the rise in the, the prescribing. Th this slide the CTC put together a few years later, it's showing you essentially the same thing. The green line on this slide represents prescription opioid sales. The red line represents 
deaths, the blue line represents addiction, and the CDC was showing us that all of these lines were going up together. And the CDC's message to the medical community was that that green line needs to go down. Of course, that was a message fought very hard against by the opioid industry. And you could see um, this was data that became available uh, from an investigation by the Associated Press and the Center for Public Integrity. The opioid industry spent $880 million um, in lobbying efforts over a 10 year uh, period. Um, and these were lobbying efforts largely to block state or federal efforts that might have caused that green line to go down. Um, and um, the, the opioid lobby was the term used in this investigation. The opioid lobby actually spent eight times more than the gun lobby, you know, NRA groups were fend spending fighting gun control. The opioid lobby was spending even more money fighting any kind of controls on uh, prescribing. This is a slide showing you oxycodone consumption in the United States, essentially sales, versus oxycodone in, in Europe. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that the opioid crisis began in 1996. You can kind of see why I said that on this slide. 1996 is the year that the oxycodone prescribing really takes off. And you see in recent years it's been coming down, but we still are consuming far more opioids and oxycodone in the United States than in, in Europe. In Europe, that red line has actually been going up because the same forces that caused that blue line to go up that you're looking at in the United States have been underway in, in Europe. And when I, when I say those same forces, I'm talking about a multifaceted campaign to encourage very aggressive prescribing. And although this slide is only showing you oxycodone, really around 1996, all of the opioids, prescription opioids in the United States start to go up. And the reason they started to go up is that was a, the year that you have this multifaceted campaign launched so that doctors are hearing, and not just doctors, pharmacists, which are dispensing opioids, are hearing from, from every direction that, we, that patients are suffering because we're not prescribing enough opioids. And if you've seen the Hulu series Dope Sick, you'll understand that Purdue was behind much of this, but there were also many other opioid manufacturers that were doing exactly what Purdue was doing, promoting opioids in the same way, giving money to these same patient groups, professional societies, working with the Joint Commission, which instituted new rules for hospitals that resulted in the smiley faces. Patients to this day being constantly asked when they're in a hospital bed to rate their pain from, from one to 10. And it even led state medical boards, the state agencies, that are supposed to protect the public against a doctor who might be prescribing narcotics too aggressively. S state medical boards fell sway to this campaign and started to encourage doctors in their states to also prescribe opioids more aggressively. In some cases, putting out policies that said, we will not sanction you for prescribing too many opioids, but we will sanction you for not prescribing opioids. As you know, and as we heard in the opening, um, there have been settlements now and there's litigation across the country against drug companies that make opioids, against companies that have distributed opioids, new cases now against the pharmacies for improperly dispensing opioids, uh, cases even against companies like McKinsey, which were advising the drug companies on how to maximize profits and how to, to improperly promote aggressive opioid prescribing for full for full disclosure I have been involved in helping states uh, in the opioid uh, litigation as as an expert witness prescribing has uh, started to trend uh, down um, and you could see the peak year was around 2011 2012 in the United States and we've seen prescribing uh, coming down since uh, there's some evidence that this decrease. Um, we'll, we'll have better data on this soon. 
uh, the, this positive trend toward more cautious prescribing, unfortunately, may have slowed down during uh, COVID because of um, uh, changes, uh, some of the restrictions, for example, on internet prescribing of opioids uh, were lifted, and we and we have seen um, essentially that this trend may not be moving in the in the right direction right now. When you look at, you know, I mentioned you and you saw earlier deaths involving fentanyl have skyrocketed, and if you looked at prescription opioids. On that very one of the early graphs I showed you, those prescription opioid deaths included fentanyl. If you tease out prescription opioids that deaths that have um, involved fentanyl from prescription opioid deaths that have not involved fentanyl, you'll see that when the prescribing trended in a more cautious direction, deaths that involve prescription opioids only actually also have trended in the right direction. But prescription opioid deaths involving fentanyl, of course, have, have gone up. So overall, when you look at these blue bars, if you look at the very top of them, you'll see we haven't made much progress in reducing prescription opioid involved deaths because many of these deaths have been involved fentanyl. So overall, we're not seeing this positive trend that we would have liked to have seen as prescribing moved in a more cautious direction. Where we are seeing more positive trends, however, trends that correspond with, with more cautious prescribing would be in neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, uh, or it's also called NAS, neonatal abstinence syndrome. And you can see that, that a couple of years after prescribing trends in a more cautious direction, you start to see less infants born dependent on opioids. What this, I believe, means is that we're seeing fewer women of childbearing age getting hooked on opioids. Um, and so as prescribing is trending in a, in a more cautious direction, it, it, it shows us that the incidence, the number of Americans becoming newly addicted to opioids may be trending downward, which is, um, obviously a really important trend. We are still prescribing opioids much too aggressively in the United States, um, so we still have a ways to go, but there may be fewer and fewer Americans getting newly addicted each year. How do we bring the opioid crisis to an end? We obviously have to prevent more Americans from becoming opioid addicted. We have to see that those who are addicted um, have access to effective treatment. There is a role for harm reduction. There is certainly a role for interdiction, particularly with trying to keep fentanyl um, out of the country. What we really want is for someone who, you know, for bringing deaths down in the short run, because I just talked a moment ago about preventing opioid addiction, but to bring down these soaring rates of opioid overdose deaths, to bring them down in the short run, really to accomplish that what we need to do is to make treatment for opioid addiction much, much easier to access while seeing that the price and the ability to obtain illicit opioids on the black market is made more, more difficult. Interdiction efforts will probably not keep fentanyl entirely out of the country, but they could make it harder for people to access or, or a bit more expensive. If you do that while at the same time making it much easier for someone who's opioid addicted to access effective treatment, for example, with buprenorphine, more people would receive, I believe, would seek buprenorphine treatment. I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. I just want to make a couple of final points. Um, what you can see on this graph, and this is the AIDS epidemic, um, we saw during the height of the AIDS epidemic in 1995, we had about 45,000 Americans dying of AIDS. And then we saw this plummeting in in deaths. And how did we see that? We had the introduction of antiretroviral therapy. If we had better access to buprenorphine treatment in the United States, we could potentially see a similar trend. And when I say that I'm not just speculating, um, this is data from France. The black line is showing you the trend in heroin overdose deaths in France. The gray line is showing you the expansion and access to buprenorphine. And when you had buprenorphine become much more easily available in France, you saw a plummeting 
in deaths involving heroin. I don't think we'd see the same dramatic trend because heroin, France was dealing with a aging small cohort of, of heroin users. It wasn't dealing with this massive epidemic that's affected an enormous percentage of the United States population. But to really bring deaths down, we, we need to do a much better job of making basically treatment with buprenorphine available on, on demand through much lower threshold access. I will stop here. In summary, the United States is um, in the midst of the worst epidemic, uh, drug epidemic in US history. It got worse during COVID to bring the crisis under control. We have to prevent more Americans from becoming opioid addicted, mainly through more cautious prescribing. And we have to see that those who are addicted have access to effective treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalanning. Appreciate all that information that you shared with us. I think we have such a comprehensive understanding now of, um, you know, what we're what we're seeing today. And uh, we're lucky here. Uh, I don't know if lucky is is the correct word. While we're our numbers are still very high in our overdoses, we are one of the few states in the nation to have um, maintained and not seen it an increase in overdose related deaths. So. Um, oh, we have a lot of people who are on today who are uh, key in in that uh, in that result, right? Who are doing a lot of things. And so um, with all of our attendees who are on and John and Jennifer, if you wanna jump in on this after Dr. Kalodny, I mean, what are uh, the top two things that, that advocates, community members, family members um, can do to help uh, address this, this crisis, both the opioid and addiction crisis as, as you spelled out? You know, that's a really great question, and it's a hard one for me. If you had said, what are the top things that policymakers could do on a state level or a federal level, which I've kind of touched on a little bit, that's that's much easier. Um, I think that um, for families, for, for the public, um, number one, keep yourselves and your families safe. Um, and remember that, that many of the people who are even dying today of fentanyl-related overdoses their addiction began with a prescription opioid and doctors are still prescribing much too aggressively. So in general, I would love to tell people that when you seek medical treatment, you should trust your medical provider. We're still in a situation where many prescribers don't understand how addictive these drugs are. They, and so um, I think number one would be do not take an opioid unless you have to. And, um, and really understand that if you're gonna take an opioid even every day for a few days, you, you will very quickly become physiologically dependent on it. So be very cautious with these drugs. If you have a loved one suffering with, with opioid addiction, try to get them the first line treatment. And although it's great when people can recover from opioid addiction without being on medicine, most people with opioid addiction can't. And so really try to seek out the first line treatment which for most, not everybody with opioid addiction should be on buprenorphine, but for most people, that is going to be the first line treatment. Thank you. And and um, John, I see you uh, you jumped on. Anything um, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I'm just to add, not to, to subtract. I um, would add for, you know, the average person without knowing specific circumstances or access to power or anything like that, um, working towards destigmatization and especially destigmatization of uh, medication assisted treatment and harm reduction is uh, incredibly useful in, in just everyday conversation um, to, to sort of talk openly and honestly about um, about access to care and, and how how much work it really takes and, and how, um, uh, how, you know, how, how much that process is a spectrum rather than a, uh, you know, binary clean or dirty or, or pro or con or good or bad, um, I think would be incredibly valuable. Sure. That, uh, absolutely. And, and Andrew, um, I know you mentioned about, um, what, uh, our government, uh, legislators, et cetera, can do. Um, and I know, John, you shared the link earlier that we put in the chat about providing feedback on the op opioid settlement money. So um, there's ways that all of us who are on today um, can advocate and can um, move forward or help to move forward or support policies um, that will ultimately save lives. Um, again, I want to thank our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Andrew Kaladny, for joining us today. Um, John and Jennifer and from Governor Murphy's office, thank you as well for being on today and for your support. Um,
we have shared information about today's uh, knockout day activities. You can go onto the website, um, share a message, you know, start a conversation. We have um, resources on on stigma, on safe prescribing, um, on a lot of the topics that were mentioned today. So encourage everyone who is on to to go ahead and and do that as well. Uh, a copy of today's slides and a recording of the presentation will be sent to um, all of our attendees after the event. And again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and um, as well as our as our panelists. So thank you everyone and uh, have a great day.